Okay, good morning everybody and Hazak Baruch. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Monday morning as we are studying together Perashat Va'era. Today's class is sponsored anonymously for the Refuah Shlema of all of Israel. My friends, our Perasha is a continuation of last week. Last week, we read how God sent Moshe to go free the Jewish people. Moshe, he finally accepts the mission, he goes. But um, when he gets to Paro, he realizes that uh, it's not so simple. It's not going to be an easy task. He goes to Paro and he says, listen, Paro, God sent me to free the Jewish people. Let my people go. And what did Paro say? Moshe thought it was going to be uh, a one, two, three mission. Yes, no problem, right? That's not what Paro said. Paro said, who is God? What are you talking about? You want to go free? Where are you getting these thoughts of freedom from? You know what? Not only are you not going free, I'm going to double the work. Now you're going to have to find your own straw because if you have time to think of freedom, it means you have extra time. You should be using that time to serve me. So now I'm going to make you do extra work. So the people now, they complain. The people are very, very upset at Moshe. Moshe, what are you making problems for us? You come in and uh, you, you, you tell us that you're going to get us out of here. And instead of getting us out of here, you only make it worse. You only make it worse. So this is what um, this is what the people tell Moshe. Moshe now over here is um, is very bothered himself. Moshe doesn't want to make it worse for the Jewish people. So our parasha continues from la- that from from that piece. Moshe last week at the end of the parasha he complains to God and he says, God, why did you make it worse for the people? Ever since I came to Paro, it only got worse. It only went south. It only went downhill. Why would you send me? And Hashem ends off last week's parasha with one pasuk. God says to Moshe, now you will see what I will do to Paro. Meaning, Yani, don't worry. It's all under control. I knew this was going to happen. It's all part of a plan. Okay, that's where we left off. And our parasha begins where God says to Moshe, how... Um, don't worry, I heard the people crying and I made a promise to the Avot that I'm going to get them out of here and I'm going to bring them back to the promised land. And therefore, go and tell the Jewish people that I'm going to take them out. Remember the four languages. I'm going to bring you to the promised land. Okay. Pasuk says, Moshe ken el bnei Israel. This is chapter 6, Pasuk 9. So Moshe says, okay, great. He goes back and he tells the Jewish people, Vaidaber Moshe ken el bnei Israel. He tells all of this to the Jewish people. He says, guys, this is all part of a plan. This is really what um, God wanted. He knew Paro was going to say no. He knew Paro was going to double the work. <laughs> it's all part of a plan. Don't get nervous. Okay, guys, let's relax. We're going to do this. What does it say? Velo shame'u el Moshe, but they, didn't, they, but they didn't listen this time. They didn't listen. Mikot ruach kasha. They were short of breath or spirit, and they were working very hard. Velo shame'u el Moshe. They didn't accept Moshe's comfort. Moshe tried to comfort them, but they didn't listen to him. This is very interesting pasuk. What does it mean? Velo shamuel Moshe mikotze ruach ume avoda kasha. There is a very, very interesting idea that the Pardes Yosef brings on these words. Pardes Yosef says, we, Let's go back to the most obvious question that we always ask when we come to this parashiyot. God sends Moshe to free the Jewish people. Now, what's the number one question if you're a Jew at the time? What's the number one question that you have when a man by the name of Moshe comes to free you from Egypt? If you're a Jew, you know history. You know that there is actually a time that was allotted to this exile of Egypt. God already told Abraham how many years they're going to be in Egypt. How many years they're going to be in Galut. Not Egypt. They didn't know that was going to be in Egypt. But in a foreign land. And uh, it was supposed to be Arba Me'ot Shana. This is what God told Abraham at the Brit Ben Abetari. And I'm sure Abraham passed that information to his son, to his son, all the way to the tribes. So the Jews know it's 400 years. 
That's how long the Galut's going to be. Problem is, if you do the math, they're not in Egypt for 400 years. They're only there for how many? Anyone know? How many years were they there for? Excellent, Jackie. 210. Okay, how do we know 210? Because we know, tradition tells us, that Yochevet, Moshe's mother, was born as the Jews came down to Egypt. As Yaakov and the family came down. She was born right there in between, they say, in between the fence, in between the wall. She was, uh, she was an immigrant baby that was born on the, you know, in between the borders. So uh, that was Yochevet, okay? So she is born. And then, how old is she when she gives birth to Moshe? Our rabbis tell us she was old. 130. Okay, interesting question, by the way. If she's 130, why do we make such a big deal about Sarah, right, being 90? That's nothing compared to Yochevet, right? 40 years older. So why is Sarah such a big deal when Yochevet was even older than her? Right? Everyone, everyone points to Sarah. But uh, this is an interesting question that's asked. Okay, food for thought. I want you to think about it. There are a few answers to this question. But either way, coming back to uh, the math. Come, come over here. Yochevet is 130. She gives birth to Moshe. Moshe is how old when he stands in front of Paro? 80. So 30, 130 plus 80, 210. Yes? Is my math right? Okay. So, if that's the case, the Jewish people are only in Egypt for 210 years. So they, they want to know, Moshe, you're here to take us out, but uh, we're not here for 400. So how do we answer this discrepancy? Okay, so there's basically two answers to this question. Two answers, two different, completely different answers. All answers fall under one of these two, okay? But there are overall only two possible answers, okay? Now, whatever answer you give me may not be the exact same answer as I'm telling you, but it'll fall under answer A, umbrella A, or umbrella B. Umbrella A is we did the 400 years some way, somehow within 210, okay? You could say it's because we work double, you could say it's because uh, it was so hard that it was equal to 400. But approach number one is that we eventually, basically, were able to do 400 years work within 210 years. That's approach one. Approach number two is that we didn't. We didn't do the 400. You're right. We actually only did 210. But God knew that we were in such a low spiritual state that if we would have stayed for one more second, right? This is what the Arizal writes. If the Jews would have stayed in Egypt for another minute, they would have been so um, caught up in the Tum'ah, in the immorality, in the impurity of Egypt, they would have never been able to leave. So God had to basically put the Galut on hold. God pressed pause on the game. And he said, let me take you out. You're not done. You owe 190, but I need to take you out in the meantime just to... Uh, just to allow you guys to breathe and come up so that you don't get stuck in here forever. Okay? We do find something similar to that when it comes to the second Beit HaMikdash. Second Beit HaMikdash, we spoke about this in the past. What was the function, what was the purpose of the second temple? You know, the Jewish people, they're in Galut. The first Beit HaMikdash is destroyed. We're in exile. And then a small group of Jews come back to the Beit HaMikdash. We rebuild it. And it was only around for another 400 20 years, right? It didn't really last. But it was destroyed again. And then we went back into Galut. So what was the goal? What was the purpose of the second temple? It's like, um, it's like take two, but we knew it's not going to be a, a legitimate take two because we're going to have to have a take three. We're going to need to have another Beit HaMikdash. So what was the goal? Why did God do it? Why did we go back? They explain that Hashem knew that the Jewish people in Galut, the way that we were, we weren't going to survive. We weren't equipped. We weren't given the proper tools. We spoke about this in the past, the idea that the Jews in Galut actually didn't do well at all. After the first temple was destroyed, almost complete assimilation. You see in the story of Purim, they ate with the Hashverosh. They assimilated. It was very, very bad. When the Jews came back to Israel, 
with Ezra to, bu- to build the second temple. Nobody was keeping Shabbat. Nobody knew anything. And the rabbis, they realized that this galut were going to be wiped out another few years. So what they did was something genius. They pressed pause on the galut that we were in. Said everybody quickly, time out. Come back to Israel. Let's train you how to handle exile. Let's give you some tools and then you could go back out. What did they give us in those 400 years? They gave us the Tzidur, right? The prayer book. Now every Jew in the world prays towards Israel. Every Jew prays in the same language. When you make a Minyan a winter vacation, you could be from South America. The other guy could be from South Africa. The other guy could be from Australia, from America, from Israel. They're all praying the same exact words. It's a beautiful thing. All the Jews now are intertwined. They taught them. They wrote for them. The, the Talmud, the Mishnayot, the Gemara. They gave them a Torah to keep them uh, busy. They educated the people. Now the Jews went back into Galut, but this time they were prepared. And actually you see that it worked because here we are 2,000 years later, not 50 or 20 or 200, 2,000 years later, and look at us. We're alive, we're strong, we're learning, we're connected because this is all thanks to the second Beit HaMikdash. So God, coming back to Egypt, He needed to take us out because it, um, it didn't... Uh, it's, it's not going to work if we stay in Galut. So basically, let's just re- recap. <clears throat> 210 years, and then we leave. What happened to 400? So overall, two answers. Answer number one is that we needed to leave because spiritually, we were so deprived, we had to get out early, and we owe God another 190 years of exile. And answer two was we finished the 400 somehow within 210. We worked extra, we worked harder, whatever it is, but we finished it. So Moshe comes to free the Jewish people. Pardes Yosef says something brilliant. He says, they asked Moshe, well, what are you doing here? It's not, it's not over. We have another 190. So Moshe says, well, I can give you two answers, whichever one you like. But Basuk says, Velo shame'u el Moshe, mikotze ruach, umeavodah kasha. They accepted neither answer. They didn't accept the Kotze Ruach answer, that they were Ruach is spirit, spiritual. They didn't accept the answer that they were spiritually deprived, and that's why we have to leave early. They didn't accept that answer, and they didn't accept the other answer of Avodah Kasha, that you worked so hard that uh, it's like you did the 400. Either answer they didn't accept. They said, ah, those are cute Dvar Torahs, Moshe, but we don't accept them. We don't, want those, we, we don't accept those answers. That's the Pardes Yosef, very nice. The question is, why did the people all of a sudden hear Lo Shame'u, they didn't believe Moshe. And earlier, earlier they did believe Moshe. When Moshe came the first time, Pasuk says two words, Vaya'amen Ha'am. The people believed. Vaya'amen Ha'am, they believed Moshe. All of a sudden now he comes back with another message from God, Ve'otzeti, ve'itzati, ve'ga'ati, ve'lakahti, this time, Velo Shame'u. They didn't want to hear it. What changed between the first time and the second time? Now look at, look at the Rashbam. Rashbam gives a very simple answer. Rashbam, Rashi's grandson, he says, Ata now, Af al minu Even though they believed originally, like it says, Vaya amen ha'am. This time, they didn't believe. When Moshe came now with the second message, they no longer believed him. What changed? It's very simple. He says the difference between last time and this time was what happened in between. The work got harder. Moshe, you lost your credibility. You no longer have credence. Before, we believed you. You came, you told, imagine a guy tells you to invest in a certain stock. He tells you he has inside information. Invest. So you believe him. You put in a few thousand dollars. All of a sudden, it tanks. You look to the guy, you say, what's going on? Who are you? He says, no, this time, believe me. Put in this stock. Are you going to believe him? Probably not, right? It's very hard to believe somebody after they already uh, messed you up. 
You give people in life, you give them one chance sometimes. It's not baseball rules, three strikes. You give a guy one strike. If you didn't do well, then I don't believe you anymore. So says the Rashbam, that's exactly what happened. Moshe comes, we believe you. But then, you're obviously not worthy of being listened to. Because your method, all your promises didn't work. You promised us uh, freedom, and then all you did was give us harder work. Therefore, that's what the Rashbam says. You don't believe because uh, of Moshe lost his credibility because the work got harder. The Ralbag, another commentary, he says something very deep. Listen to what he says. Velo shame'u el Moshe mi kotzer ruah. Pasuk says they didn't believe Moshe because they were short of breath. According to the Rashbam, what does that mean? Because the work got harder and they couldn't catch their breath. So they don't believe Moshe anymore. Right? That's what the Rashbam said. The Ralbag says, listen to this, he says, Velo shame'u el Moshe. They didn't believe Moshe. Mi ruah. Because Moshe was short of breath. Because Moshe's spirit was depleted. Ay, ay, ay. You know what the Ra- Ralbag is saying? It's not that the people were depleted. It's that Moshe was. Moshe no longer came the second time with the same fire, with the same passion, with the same excitement that he came the first time around. Moshe, the first day on the job, he was excited. Guys, we're going to go. I'm going to get you out of here. They saw in him a fire, an energy. They said, wow, I want that. I'm part of it. We believe you. But after the work got harder, Moshe already lost faith. Moshe lost his uh, belief. Not the people. Moshe. And the Ralbag says, and because Moshe lost his belief, the people didn't believe him. Because if you don't believe in yourself, how do you expect others to? You have to believe in your own product. If you expect other people to buy it. It's a very, very powerful idea. Moshe's ruach, Moshe's energy, Moshe's frame of mind wasn't the same. If you can't convince yourself, how do you expect to convince other people? Selling, they say, is believing. If you want to sell an item, you have to believe in that item. Not only do you have to believe in the item, you have to believe that the person that you're trying to sell it to needs the item. There was a very famous... Uh, salesman, one of the most famous ever. His name was Zig Ziglar. That's what they called him. And he has many books and teachings. And he says that it actually, when you believe in your product, which you need to, then it becomes a moral obligation to sell it. You're not here to make money. (laughs) If you really believe that the guy that you're selling, whatever you're selling him, he needs, then it's a responsibility to make sure that he buys it. That's how much you have to really believe and be confident. I don't know if you guys remember these things called timeshares. Remember the timeshares? When you used to go to hotels and they try to sell you a timeshare. And um, if you sit in an hour and a half, uh, um, I don't know, class or lecture where they try to sell it to you, then uh, they give you free tickets to Disney World or a free night, whatever they give you. Remember, remember those timeshares that we used to sit in? <laughs> and uh, you go and you know you're not buying it. But you go for the free tickets or for the perks or whatever they're offering you and they give you a coffee and they give you a breakfast. They make it all cool and you're sitting in there and in the back of your mind, you know, there's no way I'm buying, right? And then they actually somehow convince you and like you actually like wonder, oh my God, actually, should I, should I buy? And then at the end, you know, you call your lawyer, you call your, you know, your brother or your cousin who knows stuff and they're like, no, don't do it. They don't know. They don't, it's not worth it. And then you say, okay, I have to think about it. Like, oh, I was going to think about, just sign, just do it, right? Remember those? Remember the timeshares? And, uh, okay, fine, we're going to release you. We're just going to get the paperwork. They come back two hours later with the paperwork. They make you sit and suffer. I'll tell you an interesting fact. You ready? The timeshare people, the salesmen, in order for them to try to sell you, every one of them owns a timeshare themselves. If they don't buy the timeshare themselves, they're fired. Because how do you expect to sell something that you yourself can't buy? If you don't own one, own one, if you don't have one, why do you expect me to have one? Why are you trying to sell me something if you yourself don't do it? Whatever answers you're giving me, why don't you tell them to yourself? You understand? Very interesting psychology. This is, this is exactly what the Ralbag is saying. 
Moshe, you know why he couldn't convince the people? You know why they didn't listen to him? Velo shamewu Moshe? Mikotze ruach. Because he couldn't listen to his own words. He didn't believe in his own pitch anymore. Moshe already a little bit, a little bit. Again, what does that mean? Moshe Rabbeinu didn't have emuna. On a small level, he was depleted. On a, on a, to an extent, to a degree, yes. <laughs> Moshe, and God tells him, the Midrash says, Haval al de avdin. Woe to those legends. Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. I miss them. You, Moshe, you complain on the first day. You lack faith on the first day. The Avot, they never complain. I promised Avraham land. When he had to go buy land for his wife, Sarah, he had to pay top dollar. He, got, he had to pay through the nose. He got ripped off. And uh, he didn't complain to me. He didn't say, God, where's the land that you promised me? Nothing. Moshe, uh, Avraham went. He believed me. And even though he had to pay, but he had emuna. Yitzchak, same thing. Yaakov, same thing. So, Moshe, where's your emuna? So you see, on a level, Moshe was lacking in faith. God rebuked him over here. So, this is what the Ralbag says. In life, my friends, very, very important lesson. We're all looking to sell. Maybe you're a businessman, you're selling a product. Maybe you're trying to sell ideas, value, uh, truth, wisdom, knowledge, a philosophy to life. Maybe you're looking to sell yourself to a girl or to a guy. Maybe you're looking to have a college uh, accept your uh, application or a job interview, right? Number one lesson Ral Bag says is that you have to first believe in yourself. We got to believe that what we're selling is worth buying. We got to believe who we are. We got to carry that with us. We got to take it with confidence and say, I'm worthy. I have goods. I have goods that are worth buying. I'm an amazing person to carry with confidence. Not with arrogance, because people, something people hate is arrogance. People hate a guy who comes arrogant and as if they own the world and they do things sometimes on dates that are very foolish. No one likes arrogance. There's a big difference between arrogant and confident. Usually, when a person is actually humble, they're very confident. Because humility means that I'm really an ambassador of God. God is really the one who's giving me my success. So when I know it's God, I actually have confidence. <laughs> because if it's me, if I'm arrogant and I think it's me, I have zero confidence because I know in the back of my mind, honestly, I know I know nothing. I actually know that I'm worth zero. I know that I can't do anything. The only reason that I could have confidence is when I turn it into God. And I say, actually, <laughs> my partner is Hashem. So I have nothing to be worried about. God's the best salesman. So when I'm extended, when I'm extension of God, right? If you're if you're selling, and you have very important uh, person putting their stamp on your product, you're not worried anymore, right? Because it's not me. I'm not selling me. I'm coming as a representative of this company, this person, this logo. This logo is the sales pitch. So when a person says it's not me, it's Hashem. So actually, I come with confidence. So confidence goes hand in hand with humility. We have to believe, confident, knowing that it's Hashem that's giving me all my success. Because if we don't have confidence, who's going to hire us? Who's going to marry us? Who's going to accept us into their college? Who's going to want us to, who's going to buy from us? So number one, today we have to realize we got to believe. Okay, believe. If you believe, you're halfway there. That's what they say, right? If you think you can or you think you can't, what's the last, what's the ending? Anyone know? If you think you can or you think you can't, you are right. You're right. If you think you can, you're right. If you think you can't, you're right. In life, it's all up here. It's all up here. People that are following football now, Playoffs. Yesterday was one of the biggest upsets. One of the biggest comebacks. There was a team down, I think, by 27 points. 27 in the playoff game in football. 
to come back from that only happened two times ever ever this team unbelievable they came back they kicked a field goal to win the game at the end and they won by one point they won by one point the, the team that was down one of the craziest comebacks of all time unheard of in the playoffs only happened two times before and in the interview they interviewed after the game the QB the quarterback the guy who throws the ball they said to him how'd you guys do it you know what he said you know what he said he said one word belief we believed in the locker room in halftime we said guys our whole season we were basically down the whole year we were always catching up from behind and look at us we're in the playoffs they started off the season with a horrible record we came from behind and now we're in the playoffs and this game is kind of a microcosm of our season and we're going to do it now in the game again and they believed they walked in believing they could come back and he said it's amazing what belief can do what your belief beliefs can shape realities you know there's a whole approach in judaism called uh, positive thoughts what does that mean what does bitachon mean what does bitachon we, know, we often speak of emunah and bitachon emunah we know but means believe in God but what does bitachon mean so the hazonish the hazonish okay I'm going to share with you an uh, interesting machloket the hazonish writes that bitachon is believing that whatever God wants is the right thing that's what it means Trust, faith and trust, emunah and bitachon. Bitachon means trusting that whatever is happening is for overall bigger picture, a big reason. That's what Chazon Ish says. But there were others that argued on him. They say bitachon doesn't mean that. Bitachon doesn't mean trusting in God that whatever is happening is, is the right thing. Bitachon means thinking positive. Bitachon, according to the Chazonish, it's accepting whatever the fate is, accepting that that's what's for the best. But a whole other approach is basically saying, no, Bitachon means you having thoughts that something's going to turn out to be however you want it to be. If you think it, it'll happen. Think good and it'll be good. You ever heard of that line? Think good and it will be good. So bitahon, according to this approach, means not trusting God, but believing in the story, you writing, you writing your own story. Person who's not feeling good about Minan, believe that you'll get better. Your thoughts could put a certain energy into the world and it could change your health. Believe you, right? You can't. I don't know how I'm going to sell this product. Believe that you can. And bitahon can change. Think good and it'll be good. Okay? So that's an interesting, interesting, very big machloket, by the way. It's not just a machloket on, uh, you know, was uh, Noah, you know, uh, 500 years old or six, like, you know, who cares? This is a big machloket of life. This is a machloket on how do I, th- how do I think? Okay, so I'm not, I'm not here to tell you which one to believe in, right? <laughs> believe in. But, um, but this, is, this is what we're talking about over here. Definitely, I think even the Hazonish agrees that a person needs to carry a belief, a confidence into whatever we do in life. Okay? That's number one. Rav Kamenetsky, Rav Kamenetsky explains something very beautiful. There is a Midrash as follows. Moshe tell, the Midrash says Moshe, one day before he got kicked out of the palace, when he was still, uh, when he was still an inside man, which is by the way a big thing, we don't realize Moshe, Moshe, is uh, in a very powerful position. When he's in the beginning of his career, he's raised in the palace. He's a Jew. Paro doesn't maybe know he's a Jew, or he does, but he doesn't care. And Moshe is able to hook it up. Imagine, just imagine for a minute. A Jew somehow makes it into the Nazi party and he's able to get into Hitler's head and to talk to Hitler and to get Hitler to do certain things for the benefit of the Jewish people. This is 
Moshe. Moshe is inside and he can get Paro to do whatever he wants. And he does. He says to Paro, you know Paro, um, you're working these guys very hard. I think they'll work better if you give them one day off a week. You can let them relax. They'll, they'll put in better performance. Now, by the way, it's true for us. Many people, they're foolish. They're, like we, like we say, they're penny wise, but dollar foolish. You ever heard of that expression? Penny wise and dollar foolish. So I'll give you an example. Yitzhara sometimes will convince a person, stay up late. Stay up late, you get more done. Even in yeshiva, you learn more. Is that a smart thing or, or a mistake? What do you mean? It's a great thing. You're staying up later, learning more. What could be better? Really, this is the Yitzhara. He wants you to stay up late. Because then you sleep less. Then your mind's not as sharp. And the next day, you're only performing 80%, 70%. So you thought you're saving time by learning extra. But it's going to hurt you. Because you're, pe- you're penny wise, but dollar foolish. Maybe you gain an hour, but you lost the whole day tomorrow. Instead of learning for 20 or 15, 100%, you're learning 50%. So you ended up losing more at the end in the long run. Sometimes, right? So Moshe says, but oh, listen, what's going on over here is not working out. You're working them too hard, give them a day off. Now again, Moshe did it all on purpose. Why? Because which, Paro says, okay, which day? What did Moshe say? I guess uh, I'll give him Saturday, I don't know. <laughs> right? But Moshe did it, Bekavana. He did it on purpose so that they could keep Shabbat. Which is very interesting. Because the Jews weren't commanded on Shabbat yet. But it seems, it seems, that Moshe already knew that when they get to Marah, by the way, the first mitzvah that they kept after they left Egypt was Shabbat. Which is interesting proof, by the way. When somebody is Baal Tshuva, and they ask you, what should I keep first? Always an always interesting question. But you find that the Jewish people, what, they, what do they keep first? Shabbat and Dinim. Azuri, it's a nice proof, I think. I think it's a good proof, I don't know, that the first thing you should keep, maybe, I don't know. I'm not a big rabbi to tell you what to keep first. But um, they say kosher, people say kosher. people. I think the Jewish people, they first kept Shabbat. And you see that Moshe... Convinces Paro to let the Jews take off on Shabbat, and they did. This is what we say every Shabbat in the prayers. Yismach Moshe b'matenat helko. What does that mean? Moshe is happy with his portion. What does Moshe have to do with Shabbat? Why are we mentioning Moshe in the Amidah of Shabbat? You ever wonder that? Why is Moshe? How does Moshe can connect to Shabbat? He's nothing to do with Shabbat. But Moshe actually has everything to do because according to what we just said, the Midrash is telling us Moshe was the first guy to make the Jews keep Shabbat, to help them keep Shabbat. He got into Paro's head to let us take off. Okay? Now what do they do on this day off? Play Cheshbesh? What do they do? Play ping pong? What is a person supposed to do on Shabbat? Shabbat, my friends, is a day that we physically rest so that we can spiritually work. Yes, we have to realize that. Shabbat, people say, ah, oh, it's a day of rest. That's an incomplete sentence. That's half true. That's like saying the goal of a wedding is to go to the wedding hall. Almost there, finish the sentence. Go to the wedding hall to do what? Yeah? Today is a national holiday, MLK. What's the goal? To take off of work. Why? So many people don't know. Take off of work. And they end the sentence there. MLK, Martin Luther King, we take off. Did you ask why? They don't want you to just take off. I think. Maybe I'm mistaken. Who knows? But I think the goal was that they should take off to meditate and to focus on equality, on the values that uh, he brought to the country and to ask ourselves in our lives where can we help and promote these ideas, right? So Shabbat is not just a day to sit and uh, eat uh, bizar and, uh, you know, have the maid turn on the TV and watch. That's not the goal of Shabbat. I could do that on Sunday. Same thing. What's the goal of Shabbat? 
called Shabbat, is spiritually to reconnect. Correct? All week long, we could get lost. We could forget. We could get caught up in the shuffle. All week long, I'm busy chasing money. I'm busy buying buildings, trying to build my business, trying to build my brand, trying to build my name. And I forget about my soul. So God says, put your body on, on pause. Put your business on pause. Focus on your soul. Focus on the right things. That's what Shabbat really is. That's really also, by the way, what uh, Tzniut is. What's Tzniut? We often speak of Tzniut. Modesty. What is modesty? People think it's about covering. It's missing the point. It's true. Covering. But why am I covering? I'm covering what's not important so that I can focus on what is. You understand? The youth is realizing that my body is not me. I'm not my body. Who am I, really? Who am I? Right? Okay, who am I? I am my soul, my neshama. So sometimes you forget. You make the body the real you. And then you think that you are your body and then you focus on cosmetics and looking good here and you forget to look good here you understand so tzniut means covering this because this is not important focus on this a little bit that's what tzniut really is shabbat is the same idea shabbat is covering physical putting it away it's all a distraction now i can focus on what's really important i can focus once a week on my spiritual not that business isn't important we have to succeed and make money but it's half of the equation and a person could get lost he needs the other half so Moshe what did he do for the Jewish people on Shabbat he gave them a book our rabbis tell us he gave them which book Iyov and they studied on Shabbat Iyov Iyov is a very very deep philosophical work some say it's a true story some say it's not a true story, it's just a parable, it's fiction about a man, Iyov. Iyov was a good guy, great guy. And somehow, God went into this deal with the Yetzirara to allow the Yetzirara to destroy Iyov's health, his Parnassah, even to take away his children, all as a test to see would Iyov stay faithful to God. Very complicated work, how to understand. And really, it delves deep into the question of why do the righteous suffer, right? This is the book of Eov. That's what it's all about. And Moshe, he wrote it for them, basically, to help the Jews with what they were probably asking themselves. Why are we suffering? Why do the righteous suffer? That's us. And it was a book that they studied every Shabbat and gave them faith. So, they were able to think of God and righteousness and you know, tzaddik, viralo, and redemption. But now says Rav Kamenetsky, something very deep. What happened? Moshe now, fast forward 40 years, and he shows that he's a Jew. It's like the, uh, it's like the Jew in the Nazi party putting on a kippah, showing that he's a Jew. So now Hitler fires him. Not only does he fire him, he says, by the way, that day that I gave them off, you sketched me. I see right through what you were trying to do there. Double the work. I'm making them work now on Shabbat. So now, says Rav Kamenetsky, now they no longer were able to have Shabbat as a day off to think of freedom. Velo shame'u el Moshe. So now freedom was no longer in their dictionary. They could no longer imagine it. They no longer thought about it. They had to work on Shabbat because there was no straw. And therefore, their psyche was already distant from these ideas. They couldn't grasp the, the idea of freedom, of redemption, of Geula. So again, another lesson, another lesson that in life, if you want something, if we, if we want something to happen to us, it has to be something that we are able to understand, something that we're thinking about, something that we're studying about, right? The first step of growing is studying person wants to grow on Shabbat, they have to learn about Shabbat. person wants to grow in kosher, learn about kosher. person wants to grow in emunah, learn about emunah. 
anything in life that we want to achieve, to attain any observance, anything. First step, learn about it. The person wants to grow in watching his eyes. Learn about watching your eyes. Learning about it, something how a very powerful magic in helping us to slowly, slowly grow in those areas. Okay, we'll stop over here, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Have a wonderful, wonderful day, God willing. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.